Hello, everyone, and welcome to day four. I hope that your stories are coming along really well. I'm looking forward to reading them. If you have finished your story, send it to contact us at homeschoolquest.com for a chance to be able to win a scholarship, a reading journal, and a chance to be published in next year's Christmas challenge. Uh, I'd love to hear what has been your favorite story so far. Today, we're going to be reading The Velveteen Rabbit and a unique original story. Uh, Ruby, Snow Carol, and the annual Reindeer Games. I hope that you guys really enjoy that. We're also going to be going over the obstacle for your story. This is a really important part of making a fun and interesting story, is to give your characters a big problem that they have to solve in order to be able to accomplish their goals. Whether that is getting a gift for a kind family or delivering presents to a small village in Alaska. You need to have some sort of obstacle that they have to overcome so that the story is interesting and you can have a lot of things that are going on in your story. You want there to be character development. You want your character to start out one way, whether that is sad and lonely and by the end of the story being happy and content, or they can be arrogant and think that they know it all, only to encounter a problem that makes them realize that they need to get help from other people. So you want to have an obstacle that will show your character that they need to change their ways so that they can become a better person by the end of the story. So I'd love to hear who is joining me and uh, where you're joining me from. I'm in Southern Utah right now, so it is a little cold, but no snow as of yet. But I'm in the festive Christmas spirit with my Christmas hat. I'd love to hear if you guys have a specific Christmas hat that you like to wear while you're writing your Christmas story, or if you like to listen to Christmas music. Okay, let's get into the lesson. So this is going to be about halfway through your story. You've already had your introduction and your call to adventure. Now it is time for an obstacle. This is, they must overcome something or someone that threatens to stop them from achieving their goal. It is important to come up with an obstacle or a big problem for your story. So it's interesting. The character has to solve this big problem to get what they want. In The Little Piccola, one of the stories that we read earlier this week, she doesn't have a stocking to hang for Santa to bring her gifts. That's her big obstacle. In The Gift of the Magi, Della wants to give her husband the best present for Christmas, but she was only saved up a dollar and 82 cents. So there are a couple different kinds of obstacles that you can give your characters. You can have a puzzle or riddle. So for example, in order to finish the annual reindeer games, your elf must solve a wise owl's riddle. Or maybe your sled dog must figure out the clues on the map to lead to the right town. The second type of obstacle that you can give your character is physical obstacles. Maybe your hero has to bring a family's father home, only there's a big log in the middle of the road. Or a blizzard, which makes it really hard to make their way back home. Or maybe a sled dog hurt their foot so they can't pull the sled. You want to come up with physical obstacles. That's things in the real world that your character has to overcome. That could be a big wall that they have to climb over. It can be um, like a blizzard, an actual weather. It can be terrain. You want this is things in the real world that are preventing your character from accomplishing their goal. This helps a lot with stories that are about journeys or adventures. The goal is to get from where they are to a new place. The third type of obstacle you can throw in the mix is a timeline. So your character must get to a family, um, father's home for Christmas, but time is running out. Uh, the sled dogs are bringing Christmas friends to a small town in Alaska, but your character slept in and gets a late start. Or maybe your elf gets distracted by a pretty Christmas tree and realizes that they are way behind in the annual reindeer games. The fourth option is a bad guy. There is someone who wants to stop your character from accomplishing their goal. Mountain lion chasing the sled dogs, or bad guys trying to rob the Christmas store while your hero's trying to buy gifts. This is a character or an animal that is out to get your character and stop them. 
from doing their goal. Again, this can be getting Christmas presents, this can be finishing the race, or this can be delivering presents. So on a, in a, on a delivery on ice, there was a lynx that was their main obstacle. In A Christmas in Alaska, there was a avalanche that totally blocked the way. Both of these, we have the physical one with the avalanche and the lynx, which is a bad guy. So in this next story that we're going to share, we're going to be talking about um, a couple different obstacles. In the Velveteen Rabbit, they actually have multiple obstacles for the hero to solve. I'd love to hear if you have read this story before and if you liked it. This one actually includes vintage illustrations from the original publication. There once was a Velveteen Rabbit. In the beginning, he was really splendid. He was fat and bunchy as a rabbit should be. His coat was spotted brown and white, and he had real thread whiskers, and his ears were lined with pink satin. On Christmas morning, he sat wedged at the top of the boy's stocking, with a sprig of holly between his paws, and the effect was quite charming. There were other things in the stocking, nuts and oranges and a toy engine, chocolate almonds, and a clockwork mouse, but the rabbit was quite the best of all. For at least two hours, the boy loved him. Then the aunts and uncles came to dinner, and there was a great wrestling of tissue paper and wrapping of parcels, and the excitement of looking at the new presents, the Velveteen Rabbit, was all but forgotten. For a long time, he lived in the toy cupboard, or in the nursery floor, and no one thought very much about him. He was naturally shy, and being only made of velveteen, some of the more expensive toys quite snubbed him. The mechanical toys were superior and looked down upon everyone else. They were full of modern ideas and pretended they were real. The model boat, who had lived through two seasons and lost most of his paint, caught the tone from them and never missed an opportunity, referring to his rigging in technical terms. The rabbit could not claim to be a model of anything, for he didn't know that real rabbits existed. He thought they were all stuffed with sawdust like him, and he never understood that sawdust was quite out of date and should never be mentioned in modern circles. Even Timothy, the jointed wooden lion, who was made by disabled soldiers and should have been a, had broader views, put on airs and pretended he was connected with the government. Between them, the poor little rabbit was made himself to feel very insignificant and commonplace. The only person who was kind to him was the skin horse. The skin horse had lived longer in the nursery than any of the others. He was so old that his brown coat was bald in patches and showed the seams underneath. And most of the hairs on his tail had been pulled out to string bead necklaces. He was wise, for he had seen a long succession of mechanical toys arrive to boast and swagger and by and by break their mainsprings and pass away. And he knew they were only toys and never turn into anything else. For nursery magic is very strange and wonderful, and only those playthings that are old and wise and experienced like the skin horse understood all about it. What is real? asked the rabbit one day, when they were lying side by side near the nursery fender before Nana came to tidy the room. Doesn't mean having things that buzz inside you and a stick-out handle. Real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that just happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you're real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, he asked, or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time, but why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp ed edges, who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you're real, most of your hair has been loved off, your eyes drop out, and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all, because once you're real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. I suppose you're real, said the rabbit. And he wished he had not said it, for he thought the skin horse might be sensitive. But the skin horse only smiled. The boy's uncle made me real, he said. That was a great many years ago. But once you're real, you can't become unreal again. It lasts for always. The rabbit sighed. He thought it'd be a long time before this magic called real happened to him. He longed to become real, to know what it felt like. And yet the idea of growing shabby and losing his eyes and whiskers was rather sad. He wished he could become it without all these uncomfortable things happening to him. There was a person called Nana who ruled the nursery. Sometimes she took no notice of the playthings lying about, and sometimes, for no reason whatsoever, she went swooping about like a great wind and hustled them away into cupboards. She called this tidying up, and the playthings all hated it, especially the tin ones. The rabbit didn't mind so much, for wherever he was thrown, he came down soft. One evening, when the boy was going to bed, he couldn't find the china dog that always slept with him. Nana was in a hurry, and it was too much trouble to hunt down for china dogs at bedtime. So she simply looked about her, and seeing the toy cupboard open, she made a swoop. Here, 
she said. Take your old bunny. He'll do to sleep with you. And she dragged the rabbit out by one ear and put him in the boy's arm. That night, and for many nights after, the velveteen rabbit slept in the boy's bed. At first, he found it rather uncomfortable, for the boy hugged him very tight, and sometimes he rolled over on him, and sometimes he pushed him so far into the pillow the rabbit could scarcely breathe. And he missed, too, those long midnight hours in the nursery, when the house was silent and he, his talks with the skin horse. But very soon, he grew to like it, for the boy used to talk to him and make nice tunnels for him under the bedclothes when he said were like burrows the rail rabbits lived in. And they had splendid games together in the whispers when Nana had gone to her supper and left the nightlight burning on the mantelpiece. And when the boy dropped off to sleep, the rabbit would snuggle down close under his little warm chin and dream, with the boy's hands clasped down around him all night long. And so time went on, the little rabbit was very happy. So happy he never noticed how his beautiful velveteen fur was getting shabbier and shabbier, and his tail becoming unsewn, and all the pink rubbed off his nose where the boy had kissed him. Spring came, and they had all had long days in the garden. Wherever the boy went, the rabbit went too. He'd ride to the wheelbarrow, picnics on the grass, and lovely fairy huts built for him under the raspberry canes behind the fl flower border. And once the boy was called away suddenly to go on tea, the rabbit was left out on the lawn until long after dusk. And Nana had to come and look for him with a candle because the boy couldn't go to sleep unless he was there. He was wet through with dew and quite earthy from diving into the burrows the boy had made for him in the flower bed. Nana grumbled as she rubbed him off with the corner of her apron. You must have your old bunny, she said, fancy all that fuss for a toy. The boy sat up in bed and stretched his hands. Give me my bunny, he said. You mustn't say that. He isn't a toy. He's real. When the little rabbit heard that, he was happy, for he knew that what the skin horse said was true at last. The nursery magic had happened to him, and he was a toy no longer. He was real. The boy himself had said it. That night, he was almost too happy to sleep, and so much love stirred in his little sawdust heart that it almost burst. And to his boot button eyes that had long ago lost their polish, there came a look of wisdom and beauty, so even Nana noticed it next morning when she picked him up. I declare, if that old buddy hasn't caught quite a knowing expression. That was a wonderful summer. Near the house where they lived, there was a wood, and in the long June evenings, the boy liked to go there after the tea to play. He took the velveteen rabbit with him, and before he wandered off to pick flowers or play at brigands among the trees, he always made the rabbit a little nest somewhere among the bracken, where he would be quite cozy, for he was a kind-hearted little boy, and he liked Bunny to be comfortable. One evening, while the rabbit was lying there alone, watching the ants running to and fro between his velvet paws in the grass, he saw two strange beings creep out of the tall bracken near him. They were rabbits like himself, but quite furry and brand new. They must have been very well made, for their seams didn't show at all, and they changed shape in queer ways when they moved. One minute they were long and thin, the next fat and bunchy, instead of always getting the same, staying the same like he did. Their feet were padded softly on the ground, and they crept quite close to him, twitching their noses, while rabbits stared hard to see which side the clockwork struck out. For he knew people who jump generally have something to wind them up, but he couldn't see. They're evidently a new kind of rabbit altogether. They stared at him, and the little rabbit stared back, all the time their noses twitching. Why don't you get up and play with us? One of them asked. I don't feel like it, said Rabbit, for he didn't want to explain that he had no clockwork. Oh, the furry rabbit said, it's as easy as any. He gave a big hop sideways and stood on his hind legs. I don't believe you can, he said. I can, said the little rabbit. I can jump higher than anything. He meant when the boy threw him, but of course he didn't want to say so. Can you hop on your hind legs, said the furry rabbit. It was a dreadful question, for the velveteen rabbit had no hind legs at all. The back of him was made all in one piece, like a pincushion. He sat still in the bracken, and hoped the others wouldn't notice. I don't want to, he said again. The wild rabbits have very sharp eyes, and this one stretched out his neck and looked. He hasn't got any hind legs, he called out. Fancy a rabbit without any hind legs, and he began to laugh. I have, cried the little rabbit. I've got hind legs. I'm just sitting on them. Then stretch them out and show me like this. The, wi the wild rabbit said, and began to whirl around and dance till the little rabbit got quite dizzy. I don't like dancing, he said. I'd rather sit still. But all the while, he was longing to dance. A funny new tickling feeling ran through him, and he felt he would give anything in the world to be able to jump about like these rabbits did. The strange rabbit stopped dancing and came quite close. He came, he came so close, his long whiskers brushed the velveteen rabbit's ear, and suddenly he wrinkled his nose and flattened his ears and jumped backwards. He doesn't smell right, he exclaimed. He isn't a real rabbit at all. I am real, said the rabbit. I am real. The boy said so, and nearly began to cry. Just then there was a p sound of footsteps, and the boy ran past near them. With a stamp of feet and a flash of white tails, the two strange rabbits disappeared. Come back and play with me, cried the little rabbit. Oh, do come back. I know I'm real. But there was no answer. Only little ants running to and fro, and the bracken swaying gently where the two strangers had passed. The velveteen rabbit was now all alone. Oh dear, he thought. Why did they run away like that? Why couldn't they stop to talk to me? For a long time, he lay very still, watching the bracken, hoping they would come back. 
They never returned. And presently the sun sank lower, and the little white moth fluttered out, and the boy came and carried him home. Weeks passed, and the little rabbit grew very old and shabby, but the boy loved him just as much. He loved him so hard, he loved his whiskers off, the pink lining to his ears turned gray, and his brown spots faded. He even began to lose his shape, and he scarcely looked like a rabbit anymore, except to the boy. To him, he was always beautiful, and that was all the rabbit cared about. He didn't mind how he looked to other people, because the nursery magic had made him real. When you're real, shabbiness doesn't matter. Then one day, the boy grew ill. His face grew very flushed, and he talked in his sleep. His little body was so hot, it burned the rabbit when he held him close. Strange people came and went to the nursery, and a light burned all night, and through it the little velveteen rabbit lay there, hidden from sight under the bedclothes. And he never stirred, for he's afraid if they found him one night, it might take him away, and he knew that the boy needed him. It was a weary time, for the boy was too ill to play, and little rabbit found it rather dull and with nothing to do all day long. But he stumbled down patiently and looked towards, forward to the time when the boy should be well again, and they would go in the garden amongst the flowers and the butterflies and play splendid games in the raspberry thicket like they used to. All sorts of delightful things he planned, and while the boy lay half asleep, he crept up close to the pillow and whispered them in his ear. And presently the fever turned, and the boy got better. He was able to sit up in bed and look at picture books, while the little rabbit cuddled close at his side, and one day they let him get up and dress. It was a bright sunny morning, and the windows stood wide open. They had carried the boy out to the balcony, wrapped in a shawl, and the little rabbit lay tangled among the bed sheets, thinking. The boy was going to the seaside tomorrow. Everything was arranged, and now it only remained to carry out the doctor's orders. They all talked about it while the little rabbit lay under the bedclothes with just his head peeping out and listened. The room was to be disinfected, and all the books and toys the boy had played with in bed must be burnt. Hurrah, thought the little rabbit. Tomorrow we shall go to the seaside. For the boy Todd talk and talk, often talked of the seaside, and he wanted very much to see the big waves coming in, the tiny crabs and the sandcastles. Just then Nana caught sight of him. How about his old bunny, she asked. That, said the doctor. Why, it's a mass of scarlet fever germs. Burn it at once. What nonsense. Give him a new one. He mustn't have that one anymore. And so the little rabbit was put into a sack with all the other picture books and a lot of rubbish and carried out to the end of the garden behind the fowl house. It was a fine place to make a bonfire, only the gardener was too busy just then to attend to it. He had the potatoes to dig and the green peas to gather, and just next morning he promised to come quite early and burn the whole lot. That night, the boy slept in a different bedroom, and he had new to Bunny to sleep with him. It was a splendid bunny, all white plush with real glass eyes. But the boy was too excited to care very much about. For tomorrow he was going to the seaside, and that in itself was such a wonderful thing he could think of nothing else. And while the boy was asleep dreaming of the seaside, the little rabbit lay among the old picture books in the corner behind the fowl house, and he felt very lonely. The sack had been left untied, so by wriggling a bit he was able to get his head through the opening and look out. He was shivering a little, for he had always been used to sleeping in a proper bed. By the time his coat had worn so thin and threadbare from hugging, there was no longer any protection to him. Nearby, he could see the thicket of raspberry canes, growing tall and close like a tropical, jung tropical jungle, in which shadows he had played with the boy on bygone mornings. He thought of those long sunlit hours in the garden, how happy they were, and for a great sadness came over him. He seemed to see them all pass before him, each more beautiful than the other, the fairy huts in the flower bed, the quiet evenings in the wood where he lay in the bracken and the little ants ran over his paws. The wonderful day when he first knew that he was real. He thought of the skin horse, so wise and gentle, and all that he had told him. Of what use was it to be loved and lose one's beauty and become real, if it all ended like this? A tear, a real tear, trickled down his shabby little velvet nose and fell to the ground. Then a strange thing happened. For where the tear had fallen, a flower grew out of the ground. A mysterious flower, not at all like those that grew in the garden. Its slender green leaves and the color of emeralds, and the center of the leaves blossomed like a golden cup. It was so beautiful, the little rabbit forgot to cry, and just lay there watching it. And presently the blossom opened, and out of it stepped a fairy. She was quite the loveliest fairy in the whole world. Her dress was of pearl and dewdrops, and there were flowers round her neck and in her hair, and her face was like the most perfect flower of all. She came close to the little rabbit, gathered him up in her arms, and kissed him on his velvety nose, who was all damp from crying. Little rabbit, she said, don't you know who I am? The rabbit looked at her. It seemed to him he had seen her face before, but he couldn't think where. I am the nursery magic fairy, she said, and I take care of all the playthings the children have loved. When they're old and worn out and the children don't need them anymore, I come to take them away with me and turn them into real. Wasn't I real before? asked the little rabbit. You were real to the boy, said the fairy, because he loved you. Now you shall be real to everyone. And she held the rabbit close in her arms and flew with him into the wood. It was light now, for the moon had risen. All the forest was beautiful and the fronds of the bracken shone like frosted silver. In the open glade between the tree trunks, the wild rabbits danced with their shadows in the velvet grass. When they saw the fairy, they all stopped dancing and stood round in a ring to stare at her. 
I have brought you a new playfellow, said the fairy. You must be very kind to him and teach him all he knows in rabbit land, for he's going to live with you forever and ever. She kissed the little rabbit again and put him down. Run and play, little rabbit. But the little rabbit sat quite still for a moment and never moved. For when he saw all the wild rabbits dancing around him, he suddenly remembered about his hind legs, and he didn't want them to see he was made all in one piece. He didn't know that when the fairy kissed him that last time, she had changed him altogether. He might have sat there a long time, too shy to move, if something hadn't tickled his nose, and before he thought of what he was doing, he lifted his hind nose, toe, to scratch his nose. And he found that he actually had hind legs. Instead of dingy velveteen, he had brown fur, soft and shiny. His ears twitched by themselves, and his whiskers were so long they brushed the grass. He gave one leap, and the joy of using those hind legs was so great he went springing about the turf on them, jumping sideways, whirling around as the others did. He was so excited that when he last did stop to look for the fairy, she had gone. He was a real rabbit at last, at home with the other rabbit. Autumn passed, and winter, and in the spring, when the days grew warm and sunny, the boy went out to play in the woods behind the house. And while he was playing, two rabbits crept out from the bracken and peeped at him. One of them was brown all over, but the other had strange markings under his fur, as though long ago he had been spotted, and the spots still showed through. And his little soft nose and his round black eyes there was something familiar, and the boy thought to himself, Why, he looks just like my old bunny that was lost when I had scarlet fever. He never knew it really was his own bunny. Come back to look at the child who had first helped him to become real. The end. I hope that you enjoyed that story. I'm going to get a drink of water, and then we're going to read the next story. This is Ruby Snow Carol and the Annual Reindeer Games. Ruby leapt out of bed and bounded down the stairs. The smell of cinnamon cakes greeted her. Today was the day she would find out if she made the cut for the Annual Reindeer Games. Her ma hummed a jolly tune. Eat up, your pa's getting the sleigh ready. Ruby's heart swelled with gratitude for her parents' support. Quick as a snap, they went off to the stables. She scanned every stable door till she found her name and let out a whoop of joy. Hello, Blizzard. I'm Ruby Snow Carol, and I'm going to be your partner. Blizzard gave her a haughty stare. I don't know. I was expecting someone rich who could gild my antlers with gold and... Ruby interrupted. What kind of competition do you think this is? A beauty pageant, of course. Ruby giggled. No, you're going to be searching for Christmas hats. You can win the honor of pulling Santa's sleigh. Blizzard scoffed. Who wants to compete for a chore? Ruby gasped. Bringing Christmas to gifts to the world is a privilege. Whatever you say... Over the next few weeks, Ruby had to ask, beg, and finally threaten to withhold all candy canes for Blizzard to make him train. She made him pull slaves, humped for hats, learned the land around Tinseltown. Finally, competition day arrived. Blizzard had transformed into a powerful sleigh-pulling behemoth. Ruby was sure they would win. Santa himself gave a speech about the true meaning of Christmas, and the teams were off. Blizzard raced through the forest and found the closest hat. Just as Ruby was about to grab it, someone else plucked it from her grasp. Blizzard huffed. Come on, that's not fair. There's still nine hats. Ruby stopped when she heard a mournful cry. She stepped off the sleigh to investigate. Hidden in the snow, a little polar bear cub cried. I can't find my mama, Nanu. Blizzard's eyes flashed. Let's ask to put the walrus if he's seen Nanu. Sadly, the walrus had not seen the mama polar bear recently. Have you asked to look, the snowy owl? Get on quick, Ruby. I'll bring us to Tuluk's pine tree quicker than an elf can make a toy. Tuluk hemmed and hawed. Well, I am quite hungry, Blizzard sighed. Would a candy cane help? Tulik gobbled up the candy cane and took flight. After a few minutes, he called out, She's at the ice flows! That was on the other side of the forest. Blizzard nudged her shoulder. Keep an eye out for hats. Ruby looked, but she didn't see a scrap of red. Oh, you found my sweet darling club! The polar bear thanked her of them profusely. Blizzard and Ruby bid a quick goodbye. They searched high and low for one more Christmas hat. As the sun dawned on Tinseltown, they realized they had to head back home. There you are, Santa laughed. We were about to go searching. After hearing their tale, Santa proclaimed they were to be made members of the North Pole Rangers. The end. I'm looking forward to seeing all of your stories, and I'm curious to know what obstacle you are going to add to your story. Are you going to add a puzzle or a riddle? A physical um, obstacle? A timeline? Or a bad guy? Go ahead and put in the comments what kind of obstacle that you are going to add to your story. And once you finish your story, be sure to send it to contact us at storyquestacademy.com or submit it on storyquestacademy.com.
Thank you so much for joining me, and I hope you enjoyed these Christmas stories.